this is Face the Arrespera, a platform for conversations on Eritrea. Your host, Rissom Mesfin. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is His Excellency Andorhan Woldegerkis. Mr. Andorhan is a senior expert in the Global Governance Institute, a member of the uh, board and senior advisor of the European Center for Electoral Support. He's also the adjunct professor at Visalia's College and research fellow at the Free University of Brussels. Educated at Harvard University and uh, University of Colorado, Mr. Andorhan is a veteran of the War of National Liberation and a founding member of the Central Committee of the EPLF. He was also the president of the University of Asmara and governor of the Bank of Eritrea, member of the Provisional and the Transitional Eritrean National Assembly. He was ambassador to the EU, Belgium, France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, and the United Kingdom. Stan de Bruyne was a permanent representative to the IMO and UNESCO, special envoy to the African Great Lakes region, and special advisor to the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo. He was also the uh, Commissioner of Coordination with UNMEE, that's the United Nations Mission for Eritrea and Ethiopia. After dissociating from the Eritrean government, Mr. Andorhan worked as Advocacy Director and Senior Advisor to the Africa Program of ICG and advised the European Commission preparing the EU strategy for the Horn of Africa. Mr. Andorhan has published several articles and a recent book, Eritrea at a Crossroads, a Narrative of Triumph, Betrayal and Hope, published 2014. Thank you, Ambassador Andorhan, for joining us for this interview. I'm hugely, hugely grateful. I understand that you're one busy guy. So again, thank you for being on Face the Arrest Bar. My first question to you, sir, is um, your book is titled Eritrea at the Crossroads, A Narrative of Triumph, Betrayal, and Hope. Why did you write the book and why do you think Eritrea is at a crossroads at this time? Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to talk to you this evening, Dr. Rousson, and thank you for taking the time for this conversation. I wrote the book to tell the story of Eritrea and its people from the perspective of a veteran freedom fighter. I wanted to tell the story of the constant betrayal of Eritrea and its people at different times in history by the powers that be, and finally by the leadership of the very movement that led the war of national liberation, of which, of course, I was a member, and uh, to tell the story of the hard struggle and brilliant victory of the Eritrean people against all odds of the legitimacy and justness of the struggle for national liberation. And most importantly, I think, I wrote it to restore hope in the struggle for freedom and democracy and in the future of Eritrea. And uh, the title, A Narrative of Triumph, you know, I, the, the triumph refers to the victorious conclusion of the long political and armed struggle of the Eritrean people for self-determination. And the betrayal refers to the state of affairs that exists today in Eritrea, which represents a complete betrayal of the objectives of the armed struggle and the hopes and aspirations of the people of Eritrea for freedom, for democracy, for justice, and for prosperity. Although we fought for these very ideals, we ended up with the polar opposites of these ideals. The hope signifies the fact that today things cannot get any worse in Eritrea, they can only get better. And the resistance at home and in the diaspora picks up momentum the day when there will be a democratic transition in Eritrea is uh, not very far. And the hope, therefore, signifies the fact that today we are quite hopeful that things are about to change and the original objectives of the armed struggle for liberation, the hopes and aspirations of the Eritrean people for a free, democratic and prosperous Eritrea 
would be able to materialize through hard work and struggle. For this triumph to be realized, there was a need for Eritreans to, uh, to make a sacrifice. You opted to take part in this endeavor. You were a student at an elite university. You could have had a, a, a different career trajectory. Why did you join the struggle? You know, that was the time of the National Liberation Movement in the Third World. And Eritrea, having been, of course, was a, an Italian colony and then under British military administration and then federated with Ethiopia by a UN decision. And the emperor of Ethiopia, having abrogated that federal arrangement and annexed Eritrea, the people of Eritrea were fighting for their rights of determination. And uh, as young idealists at the time were very, very uh, uh, taken in by the struggle for liberation, by the ideals of freedom, justice, etc. There was also in the United States the Afro-American movement with the anti-Vietnam uh, war protest movement in the U.S. So we were part of this progressive global or worldwide movement. And we, we saw our people, Eritrea was, of course, subject to the escorted air policy of, uh, of uh, burn all, destroy all by the imperial Ethiopian government. And so we felt that it's not only me, but many of my former comrades in arms and many of my friends, we left uh, whatever we were doing in the West and in the East to go join our people and fight for freedom. You know, the struggle in Eritrea was a struggle for self-determination, which we believe to be a just struggle. At that time, we were inspired by the search for freedom. We felt that it would be better uh, to contribute something to the struggle for freedom in your own country, to be part of a process in your own country that would eventually lead to freedom, to democracy, to prosperity, etc. So we were inspired by these ideas. And the fact that Eritrea was at war at the time, and as Eritreans, we felt a special responsibility to go and fight for our country and for our people. Was it initially difficult to acclimate a life after living here in the United States for, you know, comfortably for quite some time? How did you find the transition from life in America to life in Eritrea in the trenches? Were you actually assigned in the trenches? Look... Quite frankly, you know, life in the U.S. and especially life in Cambridge at the time for me was uh, quite comfortable, quite easy. And life in the field was quite hard. You did not even have the basic uh, necessities of life to sustain yourself. But when we were prepared to, to go and fight, when we were prepared to, to go and die for a cause you believe to be just and ultimately victorious, then nothing stands on your way. You know, it's just a matter of willpower. You are able to, I mean, it, was, it wasn't even that difficult for me because you were prepared to do things, to accept sacrifices. And when you're prepared to accept sacrifices, adjustment becomes very simple. It becomes uh, quite ordinary, so to be quite frank. I don't mean to say that was easy. It was not hard. It was, yes, it was extremely hard at times. But you were sustained by your ideas and by the hope of eventual victory of which you were convinced. So when you're prepared to do the ultimate sacrifice, nothing can stand on your way in terms of not only adjusting, but doing what you need to do, what you need to do or which set out to do in order to achieve the objectives for which uh, you were out there. Can you share with us the cultural adjustment that took place between being an American scholar, an Eritrean scholar who happened to be in America, and then now a fighter in Eritrea with a totally different culture. You know, I, uh, quite frankly, what I can tell you is that at the time, we believed that in order for the national liberation movement to succeed, we needed a vanguard party armed with a scientific socialism or with uh, a scientific ideology. 
And this vanguard party would, of course, lead, you know, Eritrea is basically a peasant society, was and still remains a peasant society. And the Eritrean workers are very small. Eritrean intellectuals are even very, even smaller. So at the time, we believed in this ideology of scientific socialism. And as intellectuals willing to serve the cause of liberation of our people, we felt that we had to commit what you call class suicide. In other words, to forget that we're educated intellectuals living in the West, and adjust to life in Eritrea, in the, in the field, and live like the peasants, workers, people who never had the opportunity we had of going to uh, school beyond high school for most, or even elementary school or middle school, etc. So we were, in a way, an elite, but we had, in order to contribute to the struggle, we had to, of course, uh, occup ourselves with modesty and a desire to be like everybody else and forget what we were and build a new life, a new perception of life of ourselves as part of a mass or of the masses fighting for the liberation. So in a sense, I went from an open, uh, quite open, uh, especially campus life at Harvard uh, where you had open protests. There were protests for uh, calling for the divestment of Harvard's investments in South Africa. I remember, for instance, protests against Vietnam, protests against that, openly expressed and, of course, freely expressed. When we went to, 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 the, to, to the field, we, of course, it was a political and military struggle, and it was also an unequal struggle. Eritrea is a small country with a small people, and uh, Ethiopia is a much larger country, uh, of course, a larger population base. And more than that, it had the support of the powers that be, both political, economic, and financial, and of course, uh, military support of the two blocs uh, at different times, albeit at different times, I should say. So. We, we internalized the, the, the need for discipline, iron discipline, the need for internal cohesion, to hold on to your own thoughts about things, and the need to sort of develop a, a, a common sort of, outlook of, uh, sort of outlook in order to make victory possible. Sometimes it may not have been internally generated, but perhaps externally imposed by the imperatives of survival in the field, by the imperatives of survival in a war situation, uh, which was quite, of course, uh, fluid and uh, changing all the time. Yes, it was difficult, but since we really believed in, in, in doing what we did was uh, right, it was just, we were part of a legitimate movement, and in order to contribute, sort of um, minimize or eliminate our distinctness and be part of the mass of people fighting in the field like everybody else. Ambassador Anderbrahan, can you actually uh, share with us the um, series of assignments you had in um, pre-independence Eritrea? I would say generally that... Uh, my assignments were focused in areas of uh, policy, information policy for the movement, diplomatic and political work for the movement, and uh, education policy at one point, and then information policy at one point. Was there any change in your activities when the front was actively engaged in a war campaign? Of course, it doesn't change the activities, basically. But the extent and intensity of your activities change because a war situation requires greater mobilization. And as I said, being a very small country, a very small population, and the APLF really a very small organization with a very small membership vis-a-vis uh, -vis its uh, opponent, we had to mobilize our resources to the maximum in order to rise up to the challenge that we faced. So whenever there was a war situation, 
everybody in the movement, in the in the leadership, in the in the fighting units, in the different departments, had to exert their maximum efforts, maximum energy in whatever they were doing. This was not particular to anyone. Everybody has to be uh, in a situ in a what you call it maximum uh, effectiveness mode. That would be the, 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 the automatic default mode for everybody because that was a struggle for survival, which, of course, involved everybody else. We won collectively or we lost collectively. So everybody was at his or her most productive and perhaps maximum effort mode. Did you concentrate on policy making or part of your job part of your assignment also included sharing the military triumphs of, of the movement. My assignment was actually initially when I was uh, uh, at the in the information department, I was already in the central committee and therefore my task was not only to 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 develop uh, the policy required uh, for effective uh, uh, propagation of the programmatic objectives of the movement, to publicize the achievements of the movement, the political, military, social and economic achievements of the movement, but also to manage the department under the overall leadership of a certain member of the Politburo at the time. Mahmoud Ahmed Sharifo uh, was my immediate boss. And so the, the work basically dealt not only with, with the publication of our uh, official organ, but with the management of the information uh, department as well. And in the process with developing uh, appropriate information policy, like we had uh, this uh, value of not telling a lie. And that's how the EPLF was really quite credible during the war. People who heard something or who heard about something would always contact us and uh, see uh, to verify or to ascertain situations. And when word came from the EPLF as such, uh, uh, it was generally credible. Mr. Ambassador, what would you say are the most essential features of the EPLF? What stands out, as far as you're concerned, that define the quintessential EPLF? I think the most important factor that really decided outcome of the struggle as embodied by the EPLF is what I describe in my book. Uh, actually, uh, I dedicate my book to, to, to the... To the uh, memory of the martyrs, and let me let me uh, state that I dedicate my book to the memory of the martyrs who fell, so that Eritrea would rise and thrive, and that the Eritrean people would be free. So the most important asset of the EPLF was the absolute dedication, the absolute commitment, the absolute uh, devotion of its fighters to the cause of Eritrea's liberation, to the cause of freedom and eventual prosperity of the Eritrean people. This was the most decisive factor. The APLF, its fighters, uh, were true believers in the legitimacy of the Eritrean struggle, in the justness of the Eritrean struggle, and is in, in its inevitable victory. I think this was the most important element in the in the in explaining the victory of the APLF. And of course, the, there was internal cohesion, uh, which was not necessarily volunteered, uh, because we had also an iron discipline being a political military organization. And uh, so we had a sort of absolute unity of purpose or commitment to the, to the central objective of fighting the war to a victorious conclusion. So what I'm trying to say is the APLF built a military machine that was characterized whose fighters were characterized by absolute discipline, iron discipline, and um, a readiness to die for, for, for the cause whose justness they truly believed in. And uh, that's, in fact, uh, yes, uh, that was positive in one sense. It enabled us to win the war. 
But in another sense, the, the effective military machine was not accompanied by an effective political organization uh, that could, of course, safeguard the ideals of freedom, of democracy, of justice, uh, not only during the war, but also in the future of Eritrea. And that was come uh, to haunt us back today. Mr. Ambassador, would you say that there is a dark side to the PLF? Was there a dark side to the organization? I think I would not say to the APLF because the APLF is the amalgam of everyone. The APLF is its fighters, the vast majority. And the APLF is also the mass organizations inside Eritrea and in the diaspora. The APLF is also the leadership at the highest levels in the various units, etc. So I would say that there was a dark side to the leadership of the APLF but not to the EPLF as a whole. Uh, I think the EPLF, when you look at its con constituent parts, the, the vast majority, maybe 98, 99%, were the ordinary men and women, the fighters who came uh, to, to, to fight for the liberation of Eritrea, to rid Eritrea of the colonial uh, oppressor, and to make Eritrea free for the Eritrean people. And these people, I don't think, had any dark side to them. And, uh, or I did not see it, and I don't see it, to, to be quite frank. But the leadership of the APLF, especially at the highest levels, had a dark side, which has come to the fore, and which is now haunting Eritrea. Can you give us an example of what, or examples for that matter, that you say this indicated the dark side of the leadership of the EPLF and then, of course, the PFDJ? Look, there's a difference between the P e P EPLF and the PFDJ. You know, the D PFDJ is what came out uh, as, a, as an outcome of the 1994 coup, the third Congress of the EPLF, okay? And so the, 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 let's keep the two apart. We had a Marxist party inside the APLF, which led the APLF, Eritrean People's Revolutionary Party, etc., which operated in absolute secrecy. And of course, secrecy was accepted at the mod, modus operandi because in a war, we were in a war setting. So secrecy, to some extent, is, becomes a very important uh, factor of survival. You cannot go on uh, disseminating whatever you know, etc., etc. Being a very secretive organization, this secretiveness extended to the highest levels, the extent that with the top leadership, for instance, what the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General, in most cases, I should say, did, the rest of the Central Committee did not know. So there was a, a, even during the war, a concentration of decision making in one, two or three, very few individuals who knew what was going on, while the rest of the organization, including the majority of the members of the leadership, were kept in the dark. So uh, this allowed excesses like, uh, let's say, extrajudicial killings. And uh, this was not really just a, a, a particular feature of the APLF. The idea that you should liquidate uh, political opposition sprang, as I make it quite clear in the book, quite early on in the armed struggle. I can give you an inst in the first instance, when the ELF decided to liquidate the ELM, the Eritrean Liberation Movement, or Haraka in Ila Saada, in northeastern in North Sahel, in 1965, I believe. That was the first instance when the idea that in Eritrea, or in the field of Eritrea, that is in, 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 the, in the struggle, in the arena of the struggle, there, would, there could only be one organization, and in that organization there can only reign one perspective. 
uh, any other organization, political pluralism, political diversity was not only shunned, but it was criminalized and crushed. So initially it started there, then when the ELF imploded in the late 1970s, and then after the first Congress of the ELF, what the, the ELF called the National Congress, there was this infamous resolution which said that if the splinter pass don't come back by a, by a time certain, then they will be liquidated at the counter-revolution. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm explaining uh, a lot of things in very brief terms. Uh, so, but is uh, I'm I'm bringing this as an instance as, or, or as instances, and then within the PLF, People's Liberation uh, uh, Forces uh, the Group Two, uh, you had of course a movement, a corrective movement that was characterized as a destructive movement, and whose leaders and whose key supporters were also liquidated, and so what you have is the practice of eliminating political opponents and the various guises becoming a tradition of the Eritrean liberation movement as represented both by the ALF and the EPLF. And of course, this aspect, which evolved during the armed struggle and which has, of course, uh, come to a full bloom after the liberation of Eritrea, is, has become, of course, the bane of Eritrea today. Mr. Ambassador, you're a member of one of the highest members in the top echelon of the EPLF. Were you in a position to be aware of any crimes um, that raised your eyebrows that were unsettling in nature? Or you were saying that things were always done in secret? You know, in the EPLF, no matter what your position, you are supposed to focus on your tasks alone. And any any attempt to, 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 to go, of course, uh, outside that was not only frowned, but uh, frowned upon, but uh, uh, subjected you to some sort of suspicion. Other words, people were not supposed to, to be curious People were not supposed to ask questions about areas in which they were not directly involved. And also, in my case, I was often in the field, and uh, if I'm one or two years in the field, I'm also six months, a year, two, three years outside the field. So there are also gaps in, in, in my, in my uh, sort of uh, physical follow-up of what's going on in the field. In meetings of the Central Committee, the general reports, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but in terms of the day-to-day -day happenings in the different sections of the EPLF, you, not everybody was privy. And uh, of course, I should say that like most of my former uh, colleagues and comrades in arms, I was not privy to many of the things that, uh, of course, uh, that happened and about who, which we, 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 of course, come up uh, to know much later. Forgive me, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Is it possible that one could be a member of a leadership in an organization in a front and not be aware through even confidential personal conversations with people that one trusts and has developed a relationship? So would you say that you were totally, totally unaware of any crime that was actually being perpetrated at that time that we're now finding out was actually being committed with uh, almost reckless abandon to human life. Uh, look, uh, at the time, when you say a crime now, I was aware that uh, people were, uh, of course, being, uh, what do you say, uh, marginalized. Uh, very, very important cadres were being marginalized or being suspended, or being taken to what we call Halo Asora, or the, the security of the revolution, or the, et cetera. But nobody knew exactly why. And uh, you, if you asked 
people will say maybe he did something, maybe... I'm not trying to say that we were completely in the dark as to what was happening. But we did not know the reasons, and uh, we did not try to know the reasons. Uh, Many of us did not really uh, try to know the reasons as well, because we had this, um, this sense that when somebody was, when something happened to somebody, and we felt it, it was through the grapevine uh, dis- uh, disseminated that he's done this or that, but there was no mechanism to verify that. And you really did not have ma- an opportunity to verify that. So that became also a tradition in the sense that when somebody was suspended or taken in to the, uh, by the, to the security uh, under uh, the custody of the security or the security of the revolution, etc., people just said maybe he did something. What he did, nobody knew. What he did, nobody also tried to, to find out. But that sort of became a, a tradition because, as I said, everybody was focused on his uh, line of activity and... Uh, you were discouraged from trying to, to, to go astray of that and find out, say, don't be too curious, you, uh, don't, don't uh, uh, essentially you are Abdi uh, Milkataka Aitu Toy, say in Tigrinya, and they right. Milkataka uh, Felet Ait Fatin. That right. was a retort, and if you pushed that a bit hard, then you also uh, become. A, a, an object uh, of what we were trying to find out. But you have people disappearing and there's no explanation. When do you actually become aware that maybe there is some injustice under your very organization? You become aware after the facts, okay? Either in reports or discussions. Look, the EPLF was a vast organization. Even though small, it was operating throughout Eritrea. So you're aware only in the immediate vicinity of your unit or of your uh, environment. Outside that, you really have no direct physical knowledge of what was happening. But after the fact, you come to know through reports, through uh, uh, confidential conversations. But there there is nothing you could do at the time. After the fact, uh, post-facto, and then... When you become aware, the, 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 the maligning or the criminalization of that. Look, when somebody is accused of somebody by someone and measures are taken, that somebody has no right of self-defense and you do not have a mechanism to verify. And in a way, the, the fact that we were all in a war situation and we had a survival imperative, etc., sort of... Uh, uh, condone that kind of attitude. So it's not as if you were all together in one place and everybody knew what was happening. No. Some people were in Sahel, some people were in Barka, in Sanhit, in Samha, in Dunkel, in the, in the highlands, in Akalugzai, Sarai, Hamasian, etc. We were spread all over. And therefore, the things that happened, happened everywhere. And they had really no eyes, ears, or physical presence to follow up these things. So post facto, you come to learn of things. But then it's too late. Mr. Ambassador, you were asked in a recent interview about this, that the entire senior leadership of the PFDJ, which includes you, were responsible for the current state of affairs because, this is figuratively speaking, you carried the president on your shoulders and enabled him to do all the things that he's now being accused of that whatever he's doing, he's been doing all along. You replied that you were intent on liberating the country first and foremost, and thought that things would improve after independence. Can you elaborate what you meant by that? For me, and this is apparent in all my writings, including my book, the war of national liberation was essentially a struggle for for self-determination, a struggle for self-determination in two dimensions. The first aspect of self-determination for me was the right of Eritrea as a nation to decide its international status, its political status vis-a-vis other nations. 
And in that respect, I fully support the 1980 proposal for a referendum, which called for independence, federation, or regional autonomy, as was consistent with the Dirk stand at the time. So the first aspect of the, of the, of the principle of the rights of determination is the right of Eritrea as a nation to decide its future, to decide its international status vis-a-vis -vis other nations. And that we did in the referendum when the people of Eritrea overwhelmingly opted for independence. So the right of Eritrea as a nation was exercised via the referendum in the form of an independent sovereign state. The second aspect of the rights of determination is the right of the people of Eritrea to choose a government of their, uh, their own government and of course to also throw out a government that's not to their liking. That is, of course, a fundamental principle. The right of the people of Eritrea to self-determination meant that their, their right to freely choose or have established a government of their choice or to change a government that they do not see as uh, appropriate for them or a government they do not like. This aspect of self-determination has been denied to our people. They, for us, the first, the exercise of the first aspect of self-determination, that is the right of Eritrea as a nation self-determination, was to be the stepping stone for the exercise of the second right, the right of the people of Eritrea self-determination in the sense of choosing their own government in the way they wish, and therefore determining their future, managing their affairs, arranging their political, economic, and social life, that came after that. So we collectively failed in, uh, to, to implement this second, uh, the, the second aspect of the right to, to, to self-determination. So yes, this is the outcome of a collective failure. We failed at the APLF to ensure the full implementation of the rights of termination of Eritrea as a nation and Eritrea as a people. Ultimately, and fortunately, the Eritrean army delivers a lethal blow to the enemy, and now our country is free. How did it feel to be part of a winning team that you were in a leadership team that liberated the country from Ethiopia? You see, at that very moment, I must be very frank with you, I had mixed feelings. I was neither very happy nor very sad. In a way, I was happy because our ultimate objective was achieved, the independence of Eritrea. We got rid of a, an, an alien presence that was the cause of our plight at the time. Yet, in reaching that moment, there were thousands, tens of thousands, who were not fortunate enough to also share that moment of pleasure with us. In other words, the martyrs. The martyrs who included, of course, some of my closest uh, uh, comrades in arms, my closest friends, including my own brothers, my own, my own cousin, cousins, etc. So at that moment, uh, for me, I was happy that the armed struggle was over and that the struggle for reconstruction and rebuilding would start. But at the same time, uh, I had a heavy heart in, the, in that we were leaving so many people behind, so many heroic, some of the finest and best of Eritrea's uh, men and women who were living behind. And that was a terrible burden. And that's why, in fact, uh, we, we have this special responsibility to redeem their, their, their sacrifices, to vindicate their sacrifices. Mr. Ambassador, we're moving on now. So you're, you're part of a uh, transitional government and uh, you have the honor of being the first president of Asmara University. Well, first off, why do you think you were selected for this position? Did you express an interest? 
No, as I, as I said, the, the, the personal choice did not really interfere in the, in the assignment of tasks. I was not, uh, it, it, it came to me as a surprise, but uh, I should admit as a pleasant surprise. Why was it a pleasant surprise? Because I saw, for me, I always believed that Eritrea's greatest asset is its people. And uh, I saw my assignment to the university as an opportunity to develop tertiary education in Eritrea, to provide for a new, to produce a new generation of Eritreans equipped with knowledge, with um, political consciousness, with social responsibility, to help rebuild a, a, a devastated country, to help uh, develop uh, Eritrea, to help jumpstart uh, Eritrea. Because look, war is a mass destruction, was, war is mass murder, and we lost so many years of uh, opportunity to develop. And my idea was that given the assets we had during the war, we could use these assets to jumpstart the Eritrean economy, to develop Eritrea within a very uh, within a relatively short time. And it's only young men and women equipped with modern science, with modern technology, with modern management skills, uh, public administration skills, etc., uh, with uh, modern uh, medical uh, knowledge uh, to produce the doctors, the lawyers, the economists, the engineers that were necessary to rebuild the country. So it, it, it actually uh, enabled me to, the, uh, to, to, to be at the center, at the core of this process of building up a new Eritrea by uh, equipping a new generation of Eritreans with the knowledge, skills, and know-how necessary to transform Eritrea from a very poor, war-ravaged, underdeveloped country into a developed, uh, prosperous, democratic country. So that was what actually uh, sort of motivated me. Uh, to, to, to do my best when I was at the university. Mr. Ambassador, would you say that you had great ambitions for the university and that would you also say it worked or it did not work? Either way, why or why not? Look, when uh, we took physical control of Eritrea by military means, and entered Asmara in uh, 1991, there was no university to speak of. The University of Asmara had been relocated to a place called Agarfa in southeastern Ethiopia, I believe in, Ar in Arusi, in the then Arusi province. And so I had to start from scratch. And one of my first uh, steps was to draft a charter for the university to establish its legal personality as an independent, as an autonomous institution of higher learning and center of academic freedom. And also uh, organize an international symposium to which I invited Eritrean international, etc., experts, academics, practitioners, uh, researchers, etc to try to revitalize the university, revise its curriculum, its syllabus, restructure the university into different faculties, colleges, uh, and the faculties, the, the colleges into different departments, et cetera, et cetera. And that was within uh, really within a year, barely a year after I took over. And this was a very participatory process. The policy of higher education of Eritrea, I invited so many people from the Eritrean diaspora, academics, professionals, international friends of Eritrea who were, of course, supporters during the armed struggle, now, practitioners, members of the provisional government of the provisional government at the time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yes, at that time it was a moment of great hope. Uh, I had this vision of transforming the university into a center of excellence, into a center of higher learning and development-oriented research so it could contribute 
to the development of Eritrea in all its senses, in all its dimensions. I would not say I was successful because Look, I was assigned there, at, I think, at the end of uh, some time in August 1991 and fired in April 1993, so barely three years, not even three years. Uh, 1991, 92, 92, 93, actually not even uh, two full years, I should say. Uh, so what I tried to do there was establish a university worth its name, build. It was not really a university. I must be very frank with you. We're trying to, be, uh, to build a university. A university needs lots of things, not only the physical structure, and there, was not enough facility, there were not enough facilities even in terms of buildings, but you need a top-notch modern library equipped with all kinds of books, with all kinds of facilities for research. Uh, you need laboratories. You need uh, top-notch uh, academics, professors. You, you need all kinds of uh, assets to build a university worth its name. So, but I started building the foundation for a university worth its name to become a, a center of excellence in, in, in Eritrea, a center of higher learning and development-oriented research, enjoying, of course, within campus, full academic freedom, free of any political interference from the powers that be. That's why I insisted on uh, the charter, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, of course, now we have this dismal story that uh, is no longer there. You said that you were not successful. Were you I not, not success allowed to succeed. Uh, that's what I mean. Let me correct that. Okay. I was not Please allowed to succeed because I was fired as revitalization process was really in full gear when it was quite clear to me that the bases were being laid for a future university worthy of its name. At that time, I was fired. One here is there was this rancorous break in communication between you and the staff. So would you say that the, the firing actually took place because it had gotten to a point where it was difficult for you guys to work together. No, it actually had nothing to do with it. Let me be very frank with you. Uh, I had differences uh, with, with the provisional government, uh, particularly with the, the then Secretary General of the provisional government. My idea of a university was one with its uh, uh, full autonomy. There was this idea of putting the university under the Minister of Education. I resisted that because I believe the university should be autonomous, free from, uh, the university, from the Ministry of Education. I also insisted that the university should be free from activities by security apparatus, etc. And that students and faculty on campus should enjoy full academic freedom and they should not be, uh, nothing should happen to them on account of their activities on campus, etc., etc. So there were uh, arguments, there were uh, discussions about these things that some people in the secu security apparatus wanted to recruit, and I resisted that because I felt the university should be a center of academic freedom where people would engage in research and have the freedom to discuss the outcome of their research, in fact, to debate issues of national concern, of international concern, of campus concern, etc., etc., freely without the interference of the, of the uh, powers that be. So my, my, the problem I had, and of course in the APLF we don't have this uh, tradition of speaking about uh, the internal problems, we discussed it internally, and that's where it stopped. Otherwise, the problem was within about the vision of the university, an independent, an autonomous university with its own charter guaranteeing its legal personality, guaranteeing non-interference uh, non from the political, uh, non-interference in, in terms of political interference from the powers that be, etc., etc. Otherwise, this idea of a rancorous relation. Look, when I was at the university, I was able to recruit about 115. Uh, most of these people were new. They had nothing to do with, uh, with, with uh, 
In fact, I had excellent relations uh, with, I would say, 80, I would say 95% of the, of, the, of the faculty. The fact that I was trying to transform this university into a center of learning and uh, uh, higher education, a center of uh, development-oriented research, meant that I had a standing committee to assess not only the competence of the, of the, of the faculty, their background, etc. And the idea was to send those who need further training abroad for further training and to consolidate the university as an academic institution. And look, I'm accused of having fired this, that. All that is false. Uh, let me tell you this, uh, really. As, a as the president of the university, I had the responsibility, in fact, the obligation to f hire and fire on the basis, of course, whatever criteria I set out to be in the best interest of the university, competence, uh, ability, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, okay? I did not do that. But I had a committee, I had set up a committee, a standing committee to recruit, to assess, and to recommend uh, members of the faculty for further education abroad. Those who had just in a, 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 an undergraduate degree would go for a graduate degree. Those who had a master's degree would go for a PhD, etc. And I was working with other universities trying to arrange, to make twinning arrangements with universities so that I can replace these people pending the completion of their studies, etc., etc. And look, the fact that uh, many of the, some of the faculty members were fired long after I was first fired had nothing to do with me or with their uh, academic uh, competence. Uh, what happened was there was a political decision to fire all ex-members of the former Ethiopian Workers' Party, what you call ISEPA in, in some Harik acronym. So it was really a political decision, and it had nothing to do with, uh, with me being, uh, being fired. Uh, I was fired because of basic uh, uh, difference of vision about the future of the university, the status of the university, and its um, autonomous existence as an institution of higher learning and development-oriented research. On the other side, one hears the very opposite of what you just said, that Barahi Gabresullah said he was the Minister of Education at the time, had a town hall meeting, and that based on the information he received at the university where the... Um, faculty uh, was able to air whatever issues they were having about your leadership, Baraki might have recommended that you be removed from your position. What do you say to that? Look, there are all kinds of uh, half-truths in one those this and that. It's true that the, there was a, a meeting at the, the university. I was there, uh, Baraki was there, and the, the faculty was there. But I can assure you that the overwhelming majority of the faculty members supported the process of revitalization that I had undertaken. And in fact, if you want, uh, I, there are uh, people who are now in the diaspora who are part of that process, and they can tell you what actually happened uh, at the time. It's not really up to me to say this or that. Uh, to be f quite frank, I don't know what Barahi uh, recommended. He did not share it with me. And in fact, I asked the then uh, secretary of the uh, secretary general of the provisional government, uh, Saleh Kekia, uh, if there were a report produced by uh, Barahi and I should have a copy of that. I was, it was never confirmed to me and I never had a copy of that, and I don't know what Barahi had to say, but the fact is that Barahi was the Minister of Education at the time, and I had resisted the university coming under the aegis of the Ministry of Education, because I, I felt that the mandate of the Ministry of Education was uh, the, the, the elementary, middle, secondary education, pedagogy in those uh, at that at those, at those levels of uh, education etc cetera, etc cetera, and that the university should be 
uh, an autonomous institution. Otherwise, I, I, I'm not uh, in a position to say Barahi said that or Barahi did not say that. Unfortunately, he's not around to confirm or deny what people are saying. And uh, I do not want to malign anybody who is not capable of defending oneself now. Unfortunately, you know, where Barahi is or uh, might be, there is no uh, a concrete uh, uh, information as to where he's about, where his whereabouts, or his state of being, his, hand, his, medic, his uh, physical, mental health, etc. I mean, this is, of course, one of the dark sides of, of, of the of the darkest moments of, of the or darkest sides of the of the uh, of the government today that it accuses somebody does not allow that somebody to defend oneself uh, or is not even charged before a court of law. Once you're taken, you disappear. This is the state of affairs we find ourselves in. But I can assure you that in that meeting, the overwhelming majority of the faculty members supported my position, defended the process of revitalization of the university that was underway. I had a conversation with at least three instructors from Asmara University, and all of them have a um, great impression of Barahi, and they were impressed with him, with his uh, diligence, with his ability to listen, and that they considered him highly collaborative, and they appreciated his efforts to resolve an issue that they felt um, was um, in a meltdown situation. But my question to you is, do you consider yourself a collaborative leader? Did you engage and build a team in order to move the reform agenda forward? There's no question about that. I told you I organized an international symposium. So there will be a participatory process in mapping out the policy of higher education for Eritrea. I set up an academic senate at the university. I set up a standing committee to recruit. I did not recruit or fire anybody, although I had the, the responsibility. I set up committees for the various uh, for the various uh, tasks that were that I seemed very important at the time. And I don't know the three uh, uh, former teachers of the university or teachers in general. I don't know their identity, whether they were in the university or not. And. I did not say anything to malign or to to malign Barahi. I, I had as a comrade, I had a lot of respect for Barahi. We were good friends with good, good chemistry. I just said, I just pointed out the fact that I did not know what he said. I did not. I was not privy to whatever uh, report he made with me. He said he was very satisfied with how I was running with the university. We were friends after all. We we. we we knew each other for a long time, were together. So what I'm saying is the, the, the way I was fired had nothing to do with what was happening in terms of my relation with the faculty. It had to do with my vision, which diverted from the vision of the powers that be at the moment in terms of the uh, status and role of the university as a center of learning and uh, research, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, I would say that I engaged people not only at the department level, but at the faculty level, at the university level, because what I tried, it was not a university when I, uh, when I started uh, at the university. In fact, there were no faculty. There were only some secretaries, administrative workers at the university. Whoever came, I brought from Agarfa with an agreement with the then, uh, uh, what do you call it, transitional or provisional government of Ethiopia, and uh, with, uh, because we had also good relations, we were able to restore some of the assets of the university, not all of them. And I was able to recruit from the Eritrean diaspora a large number of Eritreans, including most of the professors who are at, in the Ethiopian universities in Addis Ababa, in Jima, etc., etc. So what I'm trying to tell you is, people can say whatever they want, and uh, they, they are free to do so. But what's important is to to have some sort of due diligence, to support what you say, 
uh, with evidence. Otherwise, I would say that my tenure at the university demonstrated not only a, a, a propensity to collaborate, but a propensity to engage a wider expertise outside the university community in uh, drawing up Eritrea's uh, program and policy of higher education, not only for the university, but for what we thought at the time would be uh, technical, a satellite of technical vocational schools for those who were not lucky enough to make the university. So I would say that, of course, uh, it's not up to me to say I was, good, I was this or that, but I was really engaging with the different organs that I had set up in order to build the university into what I told you earlier, a, a top-notch university worth its name. Let's let's move on to uh, after the um, the um, your removal from the university. What happens? Where I think there was a short respite from any assignment, and then you are now a new position. You are in a new position. So, would you mind sharing what that new position was? Jim's 